Lillian, uh, Raj, can you uh, maybe kick off by telling us what TBI does in Africa and what you do at TBI? Sure. Well, happy, happy to do that, um, David. And thanks for inviting us for this podcast. Um, at TBI uh, or at Tony Blair Institute, we support governments in addressing current today's challenges and help harness future opportunities. And the way we do this is by equipping leaders uh, with with information, advice in terms of how to inform their policy making, decision making. We do this by providing support on delivery and coordination. And we are underpinning a lot of this work through our technology work. And a lot of the advice and support that governments need these days is on agriculture, given agriculture is important for, agri for Africa's future development. And you work, to the, the Tony Blair Institute works in uh, around 20 countries in Africa, I understand. Close to 20 countries in Africa. And what, what do you do, Raj, and what do you do, Lillian, uh, in, in this in, in, in Tony Blair Institute's work in Africa? Yeah. At, at the TBI, I manage advisory projects across Africa. Uh, we, I'm part of the central team that supports in-country advisors, supporting governments on delivery coordination, investment facilitation, and on ag tech. Can you tell us what the Tony Blair Institute does in Africa and what you both do? Thanks a lot for that, David, and thanks for inviting us for this podcast. Um, the Tony Blair Institute's mandate is to help governments and equip government leaders in addressing today's challenges and helping governments harness future opportunities. The way we do about this is helping them develop policies and helping them deliver on those policies. Um, at the Institute, I manage advisory projects focused on agriculture and food, whereby I help governments um, better understand how to go about delivery and coordination and support them in doing that with a, in a shoulder to shoulder approach. Uh, at the same time, also help them facilitate investments uh, for critical agriculture and food projects. And most of this work is underpinned by ag tech. And Lillian, uh, what do you do at TBI? Um, you know, recognizing the value of technology in the agricultural transformation in Africa, I am working as part of the Tomorrow Partnership that brings together the expertise to advise and uh, support, um, accelerate the delivery of identified priorities within governments, and in this case, focusing on the government of Rwanda, uh, which has put together a comprehensive digital transformation agenda. So for many of our listeners, agriculture might seem like a rather low tech sector as opposed to maybe for manufacturing or services. Um, firstly, would that uh, be accurate? And secondly, how has agriculture, how has technology been impacting agriculture and food systems in recent years? That's a great question. And I think just off the bat, I think ag tech it has, I mean, in, in the world of technology, especially focused on agriculture, there's a lot of exciting innovations that are happening. So you have all things about data-driven technologies, act data hubs that help provide better information to smallholder farmers, access to inputs. In addition to that, you're also seeing a lot to do with how we eat our food. So, you know, synthetic meats um, is one. And then also in terms of how we go about doing agriculture. Uh, so this is more in the realms of controlled environment agriculture, where agriculture is done indoors rather than outdoors. So that is, all those areas are super exciting. And it's just changing the way we think about how we go about doing agriculture all the way, all, all the way to how we eat our food. Yeah, and with the growth in technologies such as sensors and robotics and drones, the question then that we ask ourselves is which technologies should government adopt sustainably? And that's where TBI comes in. And TBI provides the connection to identify the right innovations and technologies that can be sustainably adopted by the government, but also supporting the 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 driving the development of responsive policies and responsive governance systems that can support not only the adoption of these technologies, but also their scaling and sustainability. Can you give us a sense of, of some of those innovations that governments are bringing in and that, ha that are, are having in today um, an impact on, on African agriculture? In the last um, 
10 years or so, we've seen an increase in mobile connectivity and internet connectivity in Africa. And this has provided an opportunity that government is leveraging on and we have seen a prioritization, especially in the TBI implementation countries, on governments wanting to build on the technology growth to improve um, their services delivery. And some of these technologies include the use of satellites and other innovations. But in order to translate that complex technology, we have artificial intelligence and machine learning systems coming up. But the challenge is how to translate that information in a way that uh, the government can use it or derive analytics to make decisions or that farmers can use to make decisions on their farm. And TBI is working on the government priority for digital agricultural transformation in more than seven of the TBI implementation countries, including Rwanda. Uh, the governments have prioritized on agricultural data hubs. And this is with the realization that the farmer is at the center of agricultural transformation. And so the first step is understanding the farmers and the agricultural data hubs are focusing, are farmer centric, focusing on developing comprehensive profiles and registries on the farmer as the basis for deriving analytics, for informing government decision making, but also private sector involvement and investments. And from this also the basis for developing farmer facing services. To give a good example, we have satellite driven predictions that can inform when to plant and when to do certain farm activities. But this information cannot be ingested by the farmer. And these data hubs are envisioned to integrate this information so that localized and translated information can be delivered to the farmer in a way that they can understand and consume and use to make relevant decisions on their farms. I think ag data hubs are, are something which a lot of governments are keen to sort of design and implement because it helps them better, I mean, I think one of the things about ag data hubs is what governments are focusing on now are trying to get quality data, manage it, and then as, as Lillian put it, to sort of help synthesize that and sort of make some sense out of it, get some analytics of what this could be used, and then develop certain use cases that could help the, the, the millions of smallholder farmers that need that sort of information to extension services, access to finance, access to inputs, and all of that. And you're seeing this, as Lydia mentioned, we're working in seven countries. In, in Rwanda, there's the farmer management information system, which is going to be used more by the government to make informed policies to help, help address the needs of smallholder farmers. Um, in other countries like Kenya, you have the government there that's trying to sort of bring together various fragmented data sets together in one ag data hub that could be used again to help service and provide e-government services to its to its the millions and millions of smallholder farmers. So that is on ag data hubs. But you're also seeing other ag tech innovations happening across across the continent. It's not happening at the at the same pace or or as intensity as it's happening globally. But this is around controlled environment agriculture. So this is all the way from greenhouse agriculture to vertical farming. So for instance, in Ghana, vertical farming. So vertical farming would just be like you you stack them up you stack your your you know the way you grow you do it you stack them up right. and uh, you use lesser soil you use more ai to collect data so then you know you don't need to use that many inputs you don't need you don't have to worry about pests it's all indoor but the vertical farming would just be i think you have more usage of ai and data to inform with lesser use of soil and land right so in countries like uh, burkina faso where it you know, usually agriculture is done in more rural areas, whereas given the current security situation in Burkina Faso, it's difficult to do it in rural areas that's away from cities. Uh, and if you, you know, the assumption that the cities are more protected, so then in those cities, you can do more controlled environment agriculture, so more urban agriculture. Mm. So the idea is there where our colleagues there are trying to support and think through uh, controlled environment agriculture projects there. So then you could, you could have cities that are more self-sustaining and then could produce more uh, uh, um, you know, inputs or agriculture f food for for people. So, yeah. Right. So, so that's what's happening now. Uh, so you've given us some examples there. What do you think the scope is for the next ten years for for technology to transform agriculture in Africa? What should we be looking out for or trying to make happen? Say in in twenty thirty two or by twenty thirty two. 
So I'm asking yeah. to peer into the future, basically. Yeah, I think the future is very interesting for agriculture, and I think it's um, it's based on the fact that the dynamics are changing. We, um, you know, our smallholder agricultural systems were driven by by um, you know own farm farm based labor, and this is changing. And so with that cap, there's an openness for adoption of these technologies. Uh, think about smart agriculture where farming is, is um, you know, is more mechanized. I think that is the future. Uh, smart agriculture that is more mechanized and depending on technologies such as sensors to automate uh, processes such as irrigation. And the future is also less rainfall dependent the recognition with the climate changing that mm. you know we cannot continue depending on rainfall mm. and so there would be a focus on less rainfall dependent production systems and um the availability of satellites and um you know high resolution medium resolution satellites and you know the technologies that are available are providing a chance to look into the future and to understand the changes that are happening we have predictions up to the end of century that are informing the way that that right. agriculture is going to change and so um we we are already experiencing uh, the use of drones to monitor agriculture and i think that's going to be part of the future okay I think the one word that I think about in the 10 years with, with this data-driven technologies and if governments would embrace them and address the bottlenecks that are need to be addressed in order to design and implement these data-driven mm. uh, tools like Ag Data Hubs and all of that would be it will help increase inclusivity right. of smallhold, millions of smallholder farmers. So a lot of the data hubs that are being developed are by you know, large scale agribusinesses because they have them they have the capital mm. and they and uh, and you know they they, they they understand their needs but i think public sector coming in and developing this as a public good to address these millions of smallholder farmers who can get better access to inputs finance information about how to go about doing their agriculture and knowing about which markets they can access would you know transform and it would help address the inclusivity issue Right. in agriculture transformation right and, and, and with a knock-on uh, economic and social impact of course, that, yeah. that flow from, yeah, from yeah. that and also address the, the issue that we're going through currently food crisis right so if you have a better understanding of how your crops need to be grown what's needed for those crops you will and you have better access to address those needs you could address certain issues of food crisis that are happening now but at the level of smallholder farmers, not just at the large corporation level who have systems to forecast what they need and they can take into consideration any of these, uh, you know, um, unforeseen circumstances, right, mm. as we are, as we find ourselves. Mm. So I think what I see that if we were to embrace these data driven uh, uh, technologies in agriculture in the way that, you know, hopefully we will in the next 10 years, you will see more inclusivity uh, as you're seeing in fintech side. Right, a lot right. of the small traders are yeah. now have getting better access to finance. Mm. I think in agriculture we're still some way away, but hopefully in ten years you'll see millions and millions of smallholder farmers getting better access to various things that they need. Okay, um, and looking on the not the negative side, but what are the obstacles? Maybe the one or two things which need to change in order for that kind of um, positive future and for, for those positive impacts. To, to happen and to take place? What needs to change, basically? I think, and I'm sure a lot of people would have mentioned this, and it's sort of, firstly, fundamentally, it, it's the, the, it links back to these three key cross-cutting challenges which are linked to universal access to internet. So mm -hmm. the first is uh, internet, uh, sort of electricity, access to electricity and the internet, right? So across the various continents, Sub-Saharan Africa is still behind in terms of internet connectivity and access to electricity. The second is, um, you know, affordability of devices and data, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of, you know, you could uh, develop a data hub and you can develop these use cases, but if smallholder farmers don't have devices mm -hmm. or, or the data prices are 10 times more than their daily wage, mm -hmm. then they're not going to you know, get the best out of these mm -hmm. data, data hubs. And thirdly, uh, which is something, you know, which one could, con can take granted is that sort of the awareness and education around usage of an internet and its benefits. A lot of people still culturally think like, you know, I mean, a lot of 
you know, smaller farmers have their own traditional ways of doing, which are which are great. But I think getting them to better understand the, you know, what what uh, ac you know what these technologies can do, and you know, getting onto the internet and using this information and all of that can can really transform the way they do it. So mm -hmm. I think finding incentives to sort of learn more about the importance of internet data to help them better um, you know, go about increasing the agriculture productivity is helpful. So these are fundamental, but of course, you know, Lenin can talk more about in terms of uh, her experiences in Rwanda, in terms mm. of what else is needed from the government side to make things happen. Mm. So the first thing I would say is the data and data infrastructure. So with the data hubs, you know, creating these important data and collecting data that can potentially transform the business as usual case in the delivery and design of pharma services, then the first limitation is issues around data monopolies. And, and you know, we are seeing a lot of openness and push to open up data to private sector and innovators, but there's also the responsible use of that data in a way that ensures that this uh, growth and innovations are happening and still safeguarding the mm. needs of the farmers. So that is data has been a barrier and it's important that we unpack the issues around data so that it's not a barrier but an opportunity for growth. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the infrastructure to support these emerging technologies so that they are beneficial and sustainable. So and the data infrastructure beyond, um, beyond uh, access to uh, mobile phones and internet is also the infrastructure that can support such uh, big data handling and management and computing. And Rwanda is one of the countries that is ahead because uh, within the Ministry of Agriculture, there is already a data warehouse that can allow the, the inclusion of these huge data requiring uh, you know, technologies and innovations to drive uh, the development of decision support analytics. And the third thing I would say is culture. Um, it is a barrier because uh, if, if you look at the way that the diets and the farming systems are changing and the role of technology in that transformation, then it calls for a cultural change in all levels. Um, you know, so that technology and, and data and issues to do with, with the kind of uh, uh, production systems that we have and even consumption systems that we have, they all need to change so that that barrier is culture at different levels. The governments need to see technology and that is one of the things that TBI is doing to change that uh, barrier in, in, in technology being you know something complex. Uh, we already have a lot of artificial intelligence, uh, responsible use of AI policies happening both in Rwanda and in other countries so that we, we work together to unpack these technologies and harness on the opportunity that they bring to transform the agriculture sector. Uh, and so uh, TBI is also supporting the capacity building of chief digital officers here in Rwanda right. because their understanding of the value of this technology is an opportunity for them to drive its adoption and use. Yes. I see. Um, we've come to the end of the, main, the major questions, but we have a quick fire round, which I'll ask you to both respond to quickly. Um, and I think we'll... Uh, well, yeah, you're competing to go first, so I'll come to Raj first on this one, uh, and then to you, Lillian. Uh, do you think, Raj, you'll see zero hunger in your lifetime? I am an optimist, so yes, I think I do. I will see. We will see um, zero hunger in uh, the next, say, 40 years. The next 40 years? Yeah. I could see that. We could, we could, we could see, certainly see that. Um, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, if if we think about agriculture transformation, underpinning, underpinning it through act through technology, but making sure that the inclusivity angle is not forgotten, I like to think we will. Or we may, even maybe before that. And, and Lillian, are you uh, as optimistic as Raj on that? Yes, I'm optimistic that the numbers are going to reduce drastically. Right. Well, that's two optimists then. Um, what three key trends come to you again first, Raj? Do you think we'll see in food systems transformation between now and 2030? Maybe three, there may be a couple that you want to mention. So you said three? Yeah. Okay. Ah, I mean, yeah, I think, firstly, I think 
with the food systems approach, I think what's what's good about it is that you just don't focus on just agriculture. Like, how do you go about producing? It's also about how what, what do you eat, right? So you're going to see a lot. Uh, I think the way we want to, the trend was going to be like, okay, we need to grow these various crops, but at the same time, uh, what is most nutritional and what's most sustainable? So I think that to the food system approach, what's great about it is all the way from farming to plate, right? Mm. You're thinking about mm. the whole ecosystem mm. and thinking through and breaking down in certain sizable issues that you can address. Mm. So I think you're not going to just think about agriculture, but also think about food itself, like what we eat and how we eat and how that's transported to us, how we eat it and what we, you know, all of that, right? So I think that realization and awareness will be more out there and people will better appreciate that, you know, okay. um, resources are getting even more scarce. So I think that is something that's going to happen. I think second thing is like you're seeing this you know, you're going through a food crisis, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. higher prices and yeah. people are not being able to afford them. Um, farmers are not getting better access to, uh, you know, inputs. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm hoping to see, maybe I'm hoping technology can address this, is supply right. of both of both inputs mm -hmm. and then also consumption, like the the produce that raw materials that's going to use into like your final you know, final, final food, right? So mm. I think that needs to be, and that's been always been the issue is like, you know, we produce a lot. We produce way more than the number of people that live on, live on this planet. But the problem is it never ever gets to them. Right, right. right? Okay. So I think supply needs to be better addressed. And I think technology can play a really good role in better understanding how much needs to be produced and how does it get transported to people. So that's the, the second one. Um, and um, so yeah, those are the two that two. come come to my mind. But Is, maybe Lillian can add yeah, can three add more, a third maybe, or one, two, or whatever comes to mind. Really, Lillian. Sure. Um, what what uh, key trend or key trends do you think we'll see in food systems transformation between now and say twenty thirty? I would say the first and most important one is a behavioural change you know, consumer behaviors and consumption behaviors and production behaviors. Um, uh, I will give an example of a country like Rwanda. Its um, original diet is not maize-based. And, and so when we think about food security, we, we, there's a lot of focus on introduced diets. And so a shift into what we describe as food availability let's let's first talk about food availability and and you know the fact that there are foods that even with climate changing there are foods that we be, will become more viable and so a change and adaptation by the production systems by the consumers to consume the food that are locally grown and and also um you know focusing on um homegrown uh, production systems you know, there's a huge reliance on imports and the crisis with Ukraine has highlighted that, mm -hmm. especially for African nations. And so um, home, uh, local, locally driven production systems that are able to meet the demands of its population. And that could be enhanced by the, by the uh, production in neighboring countries. But the other point is um, food loss. So uh, there's a huge, huge problem with the amount of food that is lost post harvest. So right. between harvest to the plate, that is where the uh, largest losses occur. And while the focus has been on reducing post harvest losses at the farm, the kind of shift that I would want to see is where we are reducing the amount of food that is wasted right. post farm to the plate. So it also calls for, you know, a change in, in the household behaviors and food consumption patterns and food use, re reuse and recycling within the households uh, so that we reduce the amount of food that is lost. So it's, it's more of behavior and patterns that are both driven by the consumerism and that again influence the, the production systems. So I'm hoping to see more a change that reduces the amount of food waste that we are experiencing right now. Okay. I think it's the biggest challenge in the region. Okay, thank yeah. you. The final question, uh, and it's probably a quick one. Um, what's the one thing that everyone can do, every person can do, 
um, to play their part in achieving food security for everyone. Right. Um, Lillian, coming to you. Automatically clear your plates. <laughs> Reuse, uh, reduce the amount of food that is wasted at the household level. Create sustainable ecosystems where, you know, you, you know, if you have a home garden, you're using your scraps, you're using the pills for soup, but basically a, a, a personal, um, a personal push towards reducing waste. Yeah, I think uh, as all of us, I think what's good, what could be good is sort of being aware of what you eat and its impact on the environment and then being responsible, right? I, I won't say what foods you should have, what food you shouldn't. I mean, they all have certain emission labels to it. So mm. have a look at that and maybe rethink. And secondly, being hopefully being open to the various ag tech, food tech, innovations that are gonna that are gonna sort of um, you know change the way we eat or we think about food so you have synthetic meats mm -hmm. you know it could be a cultural issue but you know one should be open to seeing whether that is something you could you'd want to adopt so I think I would say you know get more information about what you're eating and being open about the food tech revolution that will that will take us over take take over how we eat food and view food so, so yeah Okay. Um, very interesting talking today. Thanks both of you for taking part in this podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you.